This is the CMO of GaiaX, Vasily Orfano. This is our newest podcast series. GaiaX is a newly aspiring, rising European association, and together with you, we can develop a new concept of data infrastructure ecosystem based on the values of openness, transparency, sovereignty, and interoperability. Join us today at GaiaX and be part of this technological ecosystem. Good day. This is the CMO Vasilia Orfano of Gaia X. Today we have uh, here with us a very important guest, uh, an independent board member, Hubert Tortieu. Good morning, Hubert. How are you? I'm fine, Vasilia. <laughs> Good. It's it's a pleasure having you with us today and having the opportunity and the chance to uh, dwell on your expertise on the economy of data sharing. Uh, Uber, I'm not sure how comfortable you are in discussing the 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 current status of, of advanced machine learning because this is where we are heading, or actually we we are in in the age of extreme and advanced machine learning, which by default encourages business to business data sharing, and this has been. Uh, intensified. At the same time, uh, policymakers, industry players, academia have extensively discussed the possible regulatory options for fostering the data-driven economy, uh, economy in, a, in a B2B sector. Uh, and this is also related to the fact that we are intensifying all processes to machine-generated uh, net data and, and value networks. At the same time, we know that this has brought about a policy debate addressing the introduction of data ownership rights. What is your opinion about this? Which would need to be the next steps on, on the regulatory basis of who in fact owns the data and who has rights over data? Okay, so this is many questions in one sentence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, first of all, let me tell you that we have been working uh, very hard between France and Germany about uh, industrial uh, of, of artificial intelligence for industry, AI for industry. We have had several conferences on that. We are very far from having artificial intelligence really useful in the industry. So while we see artificial intelligence everywhere in the B2C world, the industry uh, is only beginning to take benefit of analytics and big data and is not yet there at all for using AI for industry. I don't want to get into the detail of it, but until and unless explainability will be completely clear in the way we use AI in industry, I would say industrial people will be very careful in reusing this capability. Now, having said that, I am of the opinion that GaiaX is, I would say, the prerequisite for artificial intelligence for industry to be a success probably after 2025. So in other words, if data sharing is not sorted out first, forget about using artificial intelligence for industry. Now, there is one element which is really important and I never myself use the word data owner because data owner has some kind of a moral dimension. We are using more and more, and in the article we have written with Boris Soto for Le Grand Continent, we are using the word data holder. And I would give a very interesting example of what can be really regulated now and which will be regulated soon, 
taking one example. I was discussing the other day with a building company which was willing to use more data in order to better, to reduce cost of operation in their building. And they were telling me that the lift equipment manufacturer have decided that there will be, and this I'm going to your uh, word, the owner of all the data collected in the lift. And you can guess that uh, by having the data of a lift, you know a lot about the building. And therefore, they were willing for the building company, after they have paid for the lift, that they pay again for having access to the data generated by the lift. And as part of the Data Act, which is right now in preparation by the European Commission, the order of the data, typically the lift equipment manufacturer, is not the owner of the data. The owner of the data will be, if it makes sense, probably more the building company. We do have exactly the same problem as well in our Ag Data Hub platform for farmer. Uh, the big, big challenge for farming is that the data generated by the tractor are de facto belonging to the farmer. They are not belonging to the John Deere and Master Ferguson of this earth, okay? So I guess the regulation will sort that out, but it will take time. Now, to go back to your uh, question and to the use of uh, artificial intelligence in industry, the biggest challenge which we have uh, for industry is which, what is now called more and more transfer learning. In other words, how can we uh, do machine learning on a generic basis, for instance, to prepare the capability to have efficient algorithm to do some, uh, I would say, maintenance in a given domain, for instance, for a car, and potentially, and under which condition, can it be extended to a truck, okay? So that is typically the machine, the transfer learning discussion. And it is clear that when it comes to business to consumer, you do have once the standard artificial intelligence process, they have been uh, worked again and again and again, but there is also very specific. While in industry, it will go by given process and the intent is to have machine learning for a given process, so typically preventive maintenance, typically detection of failure, and train that in a given environment and make sure that if we extend the field of use of these uh, machine learning capability, it is done properly without introducing a BIA in the mechanism. So all this thing, I would say, is still part of the current research. And I do not see that getting to fruition before two or three years, meaning that first we need to have sorted the data sharing challenge a little bit, as I said. So typically the example of going to level four and five of, of autonomous uh, driving is exactly of the same nature. That's why we need a lot of data describing the landscape of the road in order to be able to go to level three and to level four autonomous driving. 
Uh, Hubert, you have been uh, you have been discussing about the importance of um, and the main interest, I would say, uh, to cross industry sharing of data as uh, a result of, of data innovation and improving the efficiency of the supply uh, chain management. Now, in the wake of, of digitalization, datafication, the value proposition of companies shifts across the sectors. This means that industries, as such, and where we are currently standing, they lose their conventional boundaries. They transform or they converge. So, for instance, um, it's not very clear, for instance, what exactly the automotive industry comprises right now as we're currently standing. That's why the importance and this shift of importance is going to the sharing platforms. Um, in, in terms of the data sharing economy and how you feel that the Gaia X framework, in fact, supports the next generation of sharing data, what would be the benefits that you see? And where do you see Gaia X building, obviously, on an opportunity as, as we are currently rising through the challenges, but equally um, moving, like opening the market? So, for me, at least this is what I was uh, putting uh, in the initial uh, design of Gaia X with uh, Boris Soto when we started. We need first to remove the hurdles which are preventing safe uh, data sharing. So, that's why portability, interoperability, and data usage control are necessary. But removing the hurdle does not give the incentive for the benefit. And I am absolutely amazed to see that uh, some people are uh, thinking that the minute you have removed the hurdle, you have uh, given the description of the incentive. What is fascinating today is that intuitively in Europe, we know that data sharing is good for the business. And the example I'm always using is if we take Catena X, they knew that by sharing data between Daimler, BMW and Volkswagen, they were doing good for the automotive industry in Germany and in Europe. They knew as well that by sharing data with their subcontractor, they were doing well. And therefore, it has not been such a big gap. Now, what? Uh, how can we imagine that in the US, Ford and General Motors could have decided to share their data that is simply unthinkable, okay? And uh, what is important is the following. If we take the example of else, I was mentioning Sanofi and Philips, we do believe in Gaia X that those two members of Gaia X can discuss together to build their data space, which is a place where they will share data. If you take uh, the similar situation in the US, the trend is that either Google, Microsoft, or Amazon will be, will be the instrument for this data sharing to take place. Therefore, repeating what they have done in terms of platform in the B2C world, their intention is to repeat that in the B2B world. And for me, the big challenge, and I say that with all kind of due respect for Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, we do not need them to create data space. The data sharing is a decision which has to be taken by the member of an ecosystem because they have understood the platform mechanism, because they have understood that servitization is not an end in itself, 
and that in order to get the platform benefit, you need to recognize the complementarity of data which are old by uh, the various members of the ecosystem. And this is what I think is lacking today in many of the explanation given at European level. And this is why, and I can announce that uh, in your blog, that uh, um, Toulouse School of Economy and uh, the Fraunhofer Institute of Dortmund have decided to launch a chair for uh, data economy for business, for which we are beginning to put together all the ingredients with large industry who will be uh, the godfather of uh, this initiative. Uh, Hubert, going back to your book and as we conclude uh, the current podcast series, um, I think it's a very interesting book um, as it explains how most attempts of the digital transformation of many big enterprises fail due to the fact of lacking a comprehensive and coherent strategy. Um, at the same time, um, given your expertise um, in supporting transformation and innovation, uh, this book lays out a path uh, to progressive iteration of business, of business change and business model changes. If I were a, a reader, I would be interested to, to take up on your book. Um, can you give me three points of why such a book would need to be part of my library? Uh, first of all, uh, interestingly enough, this book has been distributed through Springer, and Springer is a very innovative uh, editing company. Uh, their main distribution channel is that each of the book they publish is immediately available in 6,000 academic library in the world, okay? And this is why, and it is a little bit of a pain for me, but the book never bought as a book, but it is, is, it is bought by uh, uh, master students uh, buying only for $2.50 uh, a chapter of three pages which fit uh, their uh, memo, okay? But this is the way it goes. Now, back to your question. I believe, and this is why we have called the subtitle is Rewriting Enterprise DNA for Enduring Success. I believe that the transformation which we have in front of us are so deep that if you do not go to those kind of situations, you miss your point. And the example we give at the beginning of the book, there is an immense competition today between those companies which have understood very in depth what their customer wants and try by using digital to very quickly uh, catch up on the capability to deliver in volume, in scale, what is needed by their customer, as opposed to those companies which have been the historical incumbent and which are trying very painfully to adopt the digital uh, attitude by having all kinds of industrial constraints in terms of volume delivery. When I describe that, Vasilia, I'm describing the battle between Tesla and uh, Audi, okay? Now, I am not sure who will be winning at the end. And while uh, in the last uh, half a year, Tesla was the obvious winner, Tesla is now meeting all kinds of problems of volume delivery, which make them at risk. And in the meantime, you do have the German automotive industry showing an incredible capability to adapt. And the name of the game of this book is to say that this kind of competition between digital native and incumbent is there 
everywhere. The digital native are very special because normally they never read books, so I do not consider them as a potential beneficiary of the book, while most of the incumbent are trying to take the flavor of the startup somehow without understanding what is behind. And the book is really there to show all kinds of mechanisms which are at stake at this point. And by we are giving example in, I guess, at least six or seven different uh, markets, uh, shows how these transformation are taking place. It is clear for me that understanding the move from servitization, from product delivery to servitization, and the fact that servitization is not bringing automatically to platform if you do not, if you are not able to make separation between various sites in the market to create the opportunity for platform, all those things need to be understood by having multifaceted example, which at one point will speak to your brain because you will recognize a similarity between what you have to handle and what is uh, described in the example. So that's really the very nature of it. The economical theory of data sharing is by far not finished, not mature. All that is new. I am very proud to have convinced Professor Jacques Kremer, who did, who wrote the intro for our book, to have convinced Jean Tirole that this question of data sharing in business was totally essential. And if I want to be a little bit emphatic, if we do not understand that, Vasilia, mm -hmm. the chances mm -hmm. for European industry in the next 10 years are minimal. Okay? Yeah, so of course, of course. We, we better, can ask. Yeah. We better understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so what I understand as well is that we cannot take this up as a disjoint practice. We need to understand and have uh, the, the economy of data sharing as part of, of the business transformation imperative and as part of the business model per se in order to even go ahead to say that we are succeeding digitally. Is this what you mean? Yes, and uh, you see uh, the DNA, the DNA allusion is to show that you go to the very deep of the culture of the enterprise. Uh, so this is, uh, for instance, what is happening in many aspects with uh, DevOps versus traditional development mechanisms. This is what is happening with those cloud platform, which can uh, uh, increase their capability to handle many, many users uh, without interrupting the service. All these things are completely, uh, are very difficult to understand for people who are uh, basic engineers, where you build a bridge, uh, you build a bridge uh, to carry 10 trucks, and if instead of build a bring, uh, build uh, be, sorry building a bridge for carrying ten trucks, you build a bridge for carrying hundred trucks. You are not a good engineer. While in the new world of uh, platform, it is a given, and this is part. And just maybe to uh, in, it is very important. The name of the game in the platform business is that you start with very little number of users, very little business, and you expect that the same platform which has been helping you to attract your first customer at minimal cost will carry to get the very many customers when you have reached the critical size in each of the side. So this is completely, uh, it's very difficult to understand for an engineer who has been accustomed to build 
against requirements. It's simply that if you are not careful in the platform business, it is terrible if the platform you have built to create the market happen to be not the one you need when the market has been reached, if you see what I mean. That is obviously the name of the game of why cloud is an essential part of this exercise. Only cloud will give you the scalability to keep the same uh, technical platform, small and big, without interrupting the service. Exactly, exactly. Hubert, thank you very much. It has been a real pleasure to have you with us. Um, I know you have a hectic schedule, so it makes it even more important that you had the, the chance, the time and availability to uh, to talk to us uh, in our newest and latest product line of the GAIAX podcast series. And with that said, we would like to, to, to invite you for the next podcast series on automated compliance, which we can have uh, in the next uh, two months or so. Um, given that the summit is approaching, um, the summit of, of GAIA-X in, uh, in November, what would you like to see uh, by, by that point in, in, from, from, from a GAIA-X perspective? Okay, so uh, something we have not yet discussed, and uh, you have gently invited me to be part of your editorial committee for the summit. My view would be, uh, Vasilia, to go back to the two sessions we had in the first summit in 2020. One was about economy of data. It was driven by Professor Kremer from Toulouse School of Economy. The other one was on ex-ante compliance. It was driven by, by Marianne Frison-Roche. I believe revisiting those two topics two years afterwards to show first that we are absolutely on the right direction, but also that things have made a lot of progress, even if we have not reached the final stage. But I guess we are mature for that. And uh, what I have tried to explain this morning is now well understood by many academics. And I would say reconciliation between academics and business is almost operated in there. And I would say, and we will see that when we have the one on automated compliance, that the same situation seems to be the case for automated compliance with a very difficult uh, challenge, which is now understood by everyone. A regulation without an ability to check it has no value. Therefore, automation is important but restricting the regulation to what can be automated is also wrong. So we have to balance between the two uh, danger, which is everything should be automated or let's not have a regulation which cannot be controlled. So in between the two is really the way where we need to go. And do, do you feel that this is possible, striking the balance between the two? Uh, it is now becoming a very important political topic. If European Commission continue to pile DSA, DMA, Data Governance Act, Data Act with a meager 10 to 15 civil servants to make it happen in the industry, it is seen as a joke. And therefore, we better have an answer and I have already, and this is a good uh, news for you, I've already asked a few of the influential people to be part of our panel in uh, Paris uh, on, in November because they are beginning to raise their voice saying stop putting further regulation until you have, re you have sorted out how you want to control these regulations. Yes. Yes, this, this has been a really intriguing dis discussion, Hubert. Thank you very much again. My pleasure. Uh, <laughs> thank you again. And I hope we are able to see you once again in the next two months and uh, obviously shedding more light um, on the panel discussion uh, within our summit, uh, which will happen between the 17th and the 18th of November of this year. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you, Vasilia. Bye.